Skin signs of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Well, hey guys, I know many of you have this condition because I have seen your comments across many of my videos over the years and I've seen requests, please do a dedicated video on this condition. So what exactly is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is actually a group of inherited disorders caused by a genetic defect in collagen or something in the underlying supportive connective tissue framework. The result of these conditions is that patients have skin that's very hyperelastic and stretchy and their joints are very mobile as well as unstable. They also deal with a variety of problems related to fragility of the tissues and the blood vessels. There are actually 13 different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome out there, but today we are just gonna focus on on the hypermobile subtype. But all of the different subtypes of Ehlers-Danlos, they are categorized based on the signs and symptoms that they have, what the underlying genetic abnormality specifically is, and how it is inherited. Hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is actually the most common of these 13 subtypes. It's estimated roughly one in 5,000 people around the world has this condition. While it is the most common subtype, as you can see, it's not super common in general. It tends to be most common in women. As a matter of fact, the majority of people with this condition are women, though it can occur in men. In contrast to many of the other less common subtypes of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, one issue is that with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we don't actually know what the underlying genetic defect is, like where in the collagen pathway is there a problem? And there's no test for this. There's no blood work that can be done to diagnose someone with this subtype. For that reason, it is actually commonly misdiagnosed, and I believe it's a lot more common than the one in 5,000. So identifying the skin signs that I'm going to be talking about in this video can actually be very helpful in making the diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. One of the things you have to keep in mind is that this is a genetic condition. So there's a problem with the code for making collagen. And for this reason, a lot of things that we talk about on this channel with regards to treatments, interventions, even lifestyle habits that help improve collagen in the skin, not likely to work out here. Why? Because you can attempt to boost collagen production all you want in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but the collagen is still going to be faulty, right? Like, for example, retinoids work to stimulate the cells in the skin that make collagen, the fibroblasts, to make more. But those fibroblasts with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the code that they have, the blueprints they have for making collagen, they don't make collagen correctly. With hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the collagen and elastin fibers, they are a lot smaller in the skin and they kind of, you know, if you look at them in cross section, they have this flower-like appearance. And the reason that's important is because of this small um, size and the kind of abnormal shape, the support that's supposed to be there in the deeper layers of the skin and within the blood vessels, it's lacking. Patients who have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the texture of their skin is very soft, very silky, almost sort of velvety in texture. It's also very thin and almost semi-transparent. You can see underlying blood vessels and tendons on the back of the hands. The skin is also very fragile. They're prone to skin tears, like on the backs of their hands, for example. They have a decrease in expression of the gene for filaggrin. Filaggrin is a gene encoded in your DNA. In skin cells, it gets expressed to result in the production of proteins that are essential for your skin barrier. Number two is people who have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are very vulnerable to bruising. This is because collagen is important for the integrity of blood vessels that course through the skin and deliver nutrients and growth factors. Because the blood vessels are weak and fragile, they leak very easily. And patients with this condition can have you know, mild bruising with just ever so slight bumping into things, 
or they can have really serious bleeding issues with bleeding in the skin that goes deep in the tissue. There's nothing that you can put on the skin that takes away the bruises faster or prevents them from happening. But what you can do is prevent them in the first place by wearing protection. For example, wearing protective gloves, bandages, thick pads, especially if you are going to be doing something where you might hit your hand or you have to put any kind of pressure on any surface, but especially the delicate skin over the hands or your elbows or your knees. It's best to avoid participating in any kind of contact sport, anything that involves repetitive trauma. Low impact exercises are actually best. While supplements are unlikely to boost up collagen, there is some evidence that um, ascorbic acid, vitamin C supplementation might actually be helpful for patients with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and reducing bruising. Possibly it's thought maybe because of course ascorbic acid is important for the function of those enzymes in the skin um, and maybe whatever the defect is, you're able to overcome it here. We really don't honestly know enough about the, the true root cause problem with the collagen in hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but that does seem to yield benefit. It may also be that vitamin C, you know, it's an antioxidant, Maybe it helps compensate in other ways in terms of some of the poor wound healing and fragility of the skin overall. Conjugated estrogen. Estrogen replacement therapy can definitely help cut down on bruising, bleeding. However, one problem with estrogen therapy is that it comes with a significant increased risk, especially with long-term use, of uh, blood clots. So it's not going to be right for everyone. So the skin's really fragile. It bruises really easily. And next up is related to poor wound healing and how the skin heals from trauma. The scars that these patients make are often much larger than the initial injury site. For example, you get a scrape that's a line. Well, it takes A, it takes longer for that to heal, and B, once it heals, the, the scar is much larger than that initial cut was. Because of the way the collagen is just abnormal and healing and bringing everything together and creating supportive framework, the scar ends up being depressed, like sunken down. They're called atrophic scars. Patients who have this condition, they have to be really careful protecting their skin from slightest minor trauma, because again, prone to bruising, and poor healing and these atrophic scars. But it's especially important when, um, if and when the need arises for surgery to the skin because of the poor wound healing, the higher risk of complications. Whenever you have really poor wound healing, there's a greater risk of infection. It takes longer for wounds to close up and heal. Part of the delayed wound healing too is not just that the collagen that's bringing everything together is you know, not the right size and shape, but also the blood vessels suffer, they're weak. A big part of proper healing involves blood vessel formation, new blood vessel growth coming in, and then you know the delivery of nutrient factors and, and things to help heal and, and build new skin, essentially. It's really difficult with alar stanlos because the blood vessels are very fragile. So they break open, they leak, there's bleeding that gets in the way of good healing. It, it can be, you know, it's, it's a much bigger deal in other words. Because vitamin C may help with blood vessel fragility, vitamin C supplementation may also be helpful in regards to how wounds heal. But again, it's an area where more research is needed. Similarly, estrogen therapy, because it helps cut down on um, bleeding and it also has some benefit for wound healing. Estrogen therapy may be indicated, especially in postmenopausal women with estrogen deficient skin. The next skin sign is something called pesogenic pedal papules. Basically these little yellowish to skin colored bumps that you can see on the bottoms of your feet along the inner aspect of your heels. What these are are basically areas where fat in the deeper layers of the skin, the subcutaneous fat, herniates up through the skin. Lots of people can have this who don't have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but it's a lot more common because again, 
that supportive framework of the dermis is not quite as strong, so it's easier for that fat to herniate out through. A lot of people have these, don't even realize they have them, they don't bother them, they're not dangerous for the most part. However, they can be painful, and with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, they're a lot more likely to become painful. One complication that can arise is that as that little fat pad is herniating out through the skin, you see it with your eyes. I mean, it doesn't break the skin surface, but you just see this bulge, basically. As that's happening, it can entrap little nerves, and you can get this very sharp pain right to those areas. It can be very uncomfortable. Ways to avoid pesogenic pedal papules um, and to, especially if you're dealing with painful ones, is to avoid prolonged standing. Prolonged standing puts a lot of pressure on the skin of the feet and you know further provides a force basically for the herniation of that fat it just makes sense gravity pressure it's kind of pushing the fat to herniate even more that can be of course painful for some people you also want to make sure again you're not participating in any high impact athletic activities be real picky about the shoes that you wear. Make sure you wear shoes that are really supportive. Don't go around barefoot um, where you may need to wear orthotics. Another thing that can be super helpful for reducing these is wearing compression stockings. Compression stockings basically squeeze everything back up into place. And so they can, they can really just kind of help mush that fat that's herniated back up where it needs to go, cutting down on pain. Weight management is really important too for controlling these because people who um, are overweight have obesity, that's more pressure on the skin to herniate the subcutaneous fat out. So maintaining a healthy body weight very important. Some patients have these and they're, again, super painful. So some things that can be tried are um, injection into the bumps of either steroid or an anesthetic, or in some cases actually um, deoxycholic acid, which you may know um, by the name Kybella. Yes, basically something that can be injected in to dissolve the fat um, that's causing a double chin can also be helpful to dissolve the little herniated um, subcutaneous fat that's causing you pain in these pesogenic pedal papules. But again, a lot of people have these and they're not bothered by them, they don't even notice. Next thing um, is very stretchy skin, hyperelastic skin. Patients who have this, because of the collagen defect, they're able to stretch the skin uh, quite a bit, and then when they let go, it will go back down to, to normal right away. One diagnostic test uh, to support hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is something called the rubber glove test. Basically, if you're able to pinch the skin on the back of someone's hand and it stretches at least 1.5 centimeters, that's a clue that they have hyperelastic elastic skin. Those are probably some of the more common and more significantly associated with the hypermobile subtype. But there are a few other skin findings that may also appear in patients who have this condition that are also found in other subtypes of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. One is something called elastosis perforans serpiginosa. This is a lot more common in some of the other subtypes, but it can definitely occur in hypermobile subtype as well. And it's a complicated sounding name for a very interesting skin uh, problem, skin finding, if you will. Basically what happens is that you get extrusion of some of the um, like collagen and, and, and things out up to the surface of the skin. And on the skin surface, you see this rough, bumpy stuff and taking on these kind of bizarre circular-like configurations. It's called elastosis perforans because it's perforating right through the skin to appear at the skin surface, something you see with your eyes. Now, this can happen often on the sides of the neck. It can happen in the on the arms right here um, where your arm folds the antecubital fossa, the back of the knees. It can also happen on the face. It's very rough in texture. It's not dangerous per se, but it can be treated, although treatment success is highly variable. Then the other one um, is something called livido reticularis. Now, livido reticularis is actually common for a lot of other conditions, and it sort of occurs on a spectrum. And what it is, is you get these violet to dusky appearing patches of hyperpigmentation that it almost looks like a net. 
You most often see this on the legs, like the thighs, the lower legs. These patches can be temporary, they can be permanent. Again, they can occur on a spectrum. A lot of times you'll see this in babies, it's perfectly normal, um, and it goes away. It's called cutis marmorata on that sort of side of the spectrum. But then in certain like conditions, autoimmune conditions like lupus, it can be a lot more severe. Um, but in Patients with hypermobile Ehlers Danlos syndrome, it's it's like cutis marmorata. It's it's not dangerous. It comes and goes, brought on by cold exposure. It has to do with basically anything that is resulting in decreased oxygenation of the skin, lowering of delivery of oxygen to the skin. Um, and basically you have a, a collect, collection then of deoxygenated hemoglobin and that's what you see with your eyes in that kind of dusky um, appearance. This can improve with age and a way to avoid it is to avoid cold exposure. Always make sure that you are bundling up out there. Okay, then the other thing that um, is associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, not always there, um, hypermobile type specifically, are conditions in a family known as mast cell disorder. So mast cells are a type of cell in your immune system. They release histamine, make you itchy, um, cause bumps that come and go. Those are called urticaria, hives, spontaneous hives. They also deal with a cousin of hives that's very similar called dermatographism. Now I have dedicated videos on both of these conditions. Dermatographism, it, it literally means skin writing. Basically, if you stroke the skin, these welts come up in exactly where you stroke. So it's called skin writing because you could write your name with your finger on your skin and you would get a welt that, that welted up in the, you know, the shape of the words. So that's what it's called. It's related to hives. I really want you to watch my video on how to get rid of hives fast. And I want you to watch my video on dermatographism. If you deal with either of these issues, manifestations of mast cell dysfunction, mast cell disorder in hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, because I go into extensive detail all about how to avoid triggers, things that aggravate it, like rubbing the skin. Um, certain medications can worsen hives, mast cell release. So check that video out. When we look at at large cohorts of patients who have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we also start to see an emergence of strong associations with other skin problems. And we can kind of group those skin problems. The first is skin problems around the follicle, the pore. People who have HEDS, as we could say in abbreviated fashion, um, they are a lot more likely, it seems, to have acne or to suffer from folliculitis, inflammation around the hair follicle. And they often also are a lot more likely to deal with a hair follicle condition uh, called hydradenitis suppurativa. Now, on this channel, I've got videos going into detail regarding each of those things. Also, remember, they have a problem with inadequate expression of filaggrin. And when we hear filaggrin, um, which come to mind is atopic dermatitis, eczema. Filaggrin, really important in skin barrier function. So no surprise, patients who have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, they often have atopic dermatitis. They often have a type of hand eczema called dyshydrosis. Again, I have a video all about that, but it is a lot more common in these patients, probably perhaps related to filaggrin. Also, along those lines with problems with the skin barrier, um, around the follicle especially is the dry skin condition, keratosis pilaris, a lot more common in these patients. There's also an association with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and psoriasis. All right, y'all, so those are the skin signs of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I really hope this video was helpful to you guys, especially those of you who struggle with it. It is not necessarily super common, although like I said, I happen to think that it's probably a lot more common than we realize due to issues with underdiagnosing. Um, I really hope this video was helpful for you guys. Um, it's going to be found always in a playlist called Skin Signs Of. A lot of the videos I mentioned here are, can be found there. I go over the skin findings associated with a variety of health problems like um, iron deficiency or iron excess. <laughs> I've got a video in there related to a lot of different things like thyroid disorder or um, high cortisol. So check those out if you like these videos on skin signs of. 
But if you like this one, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.